a trio of Ducks have hit the transfer portal. We're going to talk about what that means for Dan Landing and Oregon football and some more on today's episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. And we're back like we never left. Oregon fans, how we doing? Hope everybody's having an awesome day. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. I'm your host, Max Torres. Uh, excited to have you guys along for another episode of the pod. Uh, reminder to like, comment, and subscribe wherever you're listening or watching today's episode. You can find the Ducks Dish Podcast on your podcasting platform of choice. And we're coming to you on YouTube at Oregon Football Max Torres. Appreciate all the continued support. And if you're a new listener, welcome aboard. Uh, so on today's episode of the Ducks Dish podcast, we have some transfer portal movement for Oregon football. We're going to break down each of those players and what their departures mean for Dan Lanning's program. And uh, also a little bit about... Uh, some offers that Oregon has made in the transfer portal as the Ducks look to enhance and bolster their roster by using the transfer portal. So let's see, where do we want to start out on today's episode? I think the best place to start on today's episode is Keith Brown. Uh, Keith Brown, you know, third year uh, well, rising junior linebacker for Oregon. He was the first one to enter his name in the transfer portal in this recent wave for the Ducks. Uh, might add that the uh, the NCAA opened the transfer portal two weeks early, uh, something that I think caught a lot of people off guard and by surprise. And to do it while spring football is still going on is is really interesting. Um, but but with that being said, let's go ahead and and read Keith Brown's you know farewell note. I always want to put the players' words out there. Brown saying, quote, thank you, Oregon. I appreciate everything that you have taught me. I loved every moment of being a duck, and I will cherish that forever. No love lost. Thank you to Chief, Miss Steph, Rachel, and the whole training staff. Thank you to all the coaches that helped me become to the player that I am today. And thank you to the fans that have supported me from day one. I will be entering my name in the transfer portal. Signed, Chief Keith. So, uh, yeah, this is a this is a move that was a pretty big shocker for a lot of Oregon fans, and I think that that's for a number of reasons, right? Um, the first one being that Brown was in line for more snaps in 2023 after finishing the 2022 season on a pretty high note, playing his best game of the year in that Holiday Bowl win over North Carolina, and. With the Ducks losing Noah Sewell to the uh, NFL draft later this month, we got to see where he lands. I think he'll, I don't know where he'll get drafted, but I have no doubts that he'll end up on an NFL team. With him going to the draft next year, to the draft this year, rather, Keith Brown was slated to be a guy that was competing for a starting spot on Dan Lanning's defense uh, alongside Jeffrey Bossa. So this move came as a surprise for, for that reason. You know, a lot of times transfer portal movement is is attributed to playing time. And uh, it looked like that might have been a, a little bit of the, the reason here uh, because the Ducks also added a couple of players from the transfer portal. Uh, so, you know, Brown is is on his way out, but a couple of players come in. So we can also talk about the, the depth that the linebacker room I'm going to get into that in just a second. But the, the interesting thing is that this move comes just after Keith Brown said he wanted to be a duck, you know, and he wanted to, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he was, you know, saying along the lines of, uh, I could have been one of those transfer portal guys. Uh, you know, I've, I've always been a duck. He, he grew up in Oregon, right, in Lebanon. Uh, so he's, he's a guy that is on this roster that you can probably say safely, you know, it means a little bit more to him. I think, you know, same thing with Alex Forsyth, Ryan Walk and Justin Herbert in, in past years, Patrick Herbert now, Cam McCormick before he hit the transfer portal. Um, it's it's something special, something different to uh, these guys that come from the state of Oregon and have the opportunity to represent their home state. So to hear Brown, you know, make make his comments about wanting to be a duck, you know, this is, this is, you know, home for him. It means a lot to him. He's, he's always been a duck, grew up a duck fan uh, along those lines. It, it makes it a, a shocking move, but now that he's entering the transfer portal, 
we all we can do is is kind of you know look ahead, look at what's next, what this move means for Oregon. I talked about how Brown was in line to, to get a uh, notable increase in playing time and snaps this year. Um, we know that he played a lot in 2021, even as a true freshman. You'll remember this was an Adidas All American signee in Oregon's 2021 class, so it's not like Brown was just some walk on or. And he was a highly touted player coming to Oregon, and he kind of got thrown into the fire in 2021 with some injuries to that linebacker room, and he looked like he was really stepping into his own. But now that he's gone, the Ducks have some other names that they're going to turn to. Jeffrey Boss is the most experienced returner, even though he's a converted safety after signing with the Ducks as a safety in, in 2021. So Jeffrey Boss is obviously a big name to know there. He's emerged as a big leader for that defense. Um, and then you also have Harrison Tagger and Devin Jackson, a pair of really athletic, fast, twitchy linebackers that the Ducks signed in 2022. Uh, they didn't see too much playing time last year as true freshmen, um, which wasn't a huge surprise. Uh, I think part of that also had to do with them being a little bit undersized, and you need to kind of get those guys built up in the weight room with Wilson Love and the rest of that strength and conditioning staff to ultimately get them ready to see the field in, in, in larger action. Um, so you have those guys as, as some of the returners that come back in your room. And you also add Jerry Mixon from the 2023 recruiting class. He, um, he joined the Ducks for the uh, you know, second half of, of spring ball after being touted as one of the best athletes, one of the best recruits out of the Bay Area coming from Sacred Heart Cathedral in San Francisco, cousin of Joe Mixon, uh, you know, NFL star running back. He's super athletic, and I'm excited to see how he fits in. But I don't know if he's necessarily going to be competing for early playing time. So let's get to some of the transfers that the Ducks added. Justin Jacobs out of Iowa and Connor Soley out of Arizona State. Those are two names that are going to be that you're going to be hearing a lot in 2023. I think Justin Jacobs was already one of the better additions that any team could have added in the transfer portal. You look at Iowa and what they've been able to do defensively, they've really made a name for themselves as a school that has pretty strong linebacker play in particular. Um, you know, Jack Campbell was the, the guy that drew all the buzz and attention, but Justin Jacobs was there as well, you know, right alongside him, but he got banged up, wasn't able to play a, a full season in 2022. So he's coming off of an injury, but uh, you know, all the return from, from uh, spring ball has been positive on, on Justin Jacobs. He's, already generating NFL draft buzz because he's going to be getting coached up by Tosh Lapoy and Dan Lanning. Uh, and then now Brian Michalowski as well. Uh, the, the new uh, inside linebackers coach that the ducks added from, from Oregon state. So there's a lot of reason to think that Justin Jacobs will be able to take that next step, but as promising as everything can, can sound or, you know, look on the surface, we're not really going to know what this room looks like until the spring game. And even then, it's going to be a little bit hard to get a good feel for what the depth looks like at that position because they split the guys up. You know, you're not going to see first team on first team, good on good necessarily, uh, every drive, every play. Um, but but those guys come to Oregon with, uh, you know, some pretty lofty expectations, prim primarily Jacobs. I think that Connor Soley was a little bit of an under-the-radar addition coming over from Arizona State, also a former safety, um, you know, but, but sources around the program told me that he's – He's a guy that they're really excited about and, and, you know, they think has a lot of upside and potential at Oregon after spending, uh, you know, his previous years with the Sun Devils out in Tempe. So he's played a lot of football. So you have two veterans in that room that are going to kind of help bridge the gap. But the other guy that I think has a lot of people excited in spring football is Jamal Hill. Uh, Jamal Hill is looking like he's working at linebacker and, you know, he's, he's up to, 227 pounds. So I, I don't think that this looks like a short term move for Jamal Hill. You, you don't see a lot of DBs playing close to 230 pounds. Um, and he's, he's looking, he's looking thick out there, you know, he's put on a lot of weight. Um, so he, he looks like he has more of a body type of your traditional linebacker and, and the, the return has been pretty good. You know, he's, he's still got some room to grow, obviously room to learn, but I think he was saying yesterday following the practice interviews that he kind of wishes he would have done it sooner. Um, but this move makes a lot of sense, not only because of Oregon's depth there, but because of their depth at the safety spot, you know, with guys like Brian Addison, Steve Stevens, also back uh, on that group in that group, 
Uh, I think that, uh, you know, this is the perfect time to try to get Jamal Hill rolling at a new position uh, because um, he hasn't necessarily been able to kind of get himself back to that level of play from his breakout 2019 season where he had those two picks against USC. And then I think a lot of people had a lot of hype and were expecting a lot. And, and he hasn't necessarily lived up to the expectations there, but we know that he's a physical guy. Um, he, he said he loves being in the box, being by the action. And, and that will probably help him, you know, transition into that room and, and be a name that we see a little bit more of. Because even though he hasn't played a lot of linebacker, this is another experienced guy. And I think that if you can roll out experience on your on your defense, obviously, and manning the middle like that, that's going to be really big. Another reason I think I like this move for Jamal Hill and, and what it means for the inside linebacker group is you have a former DB you kind of think that lends itself to having better coverage, right? The Ducks were not good in pass coverage at the linebacker spot last year. That's no secret. You don't need me to tell you that. But I think that's another piece of the upside that comes with this move for Jamal Hill. So that linebacker room is is a, a little bit of a mystery right now. But Dan Lanning says that he really likes the depth that this defense has, pretty much being pretty straightforward about we have more depth defensively on this year's team than we did last year. And he also added that he wants, you know, starters to be able to play on special teams, particularly from the linebacker spot. Um, so you want to have guys that are going to be able to affect the game in a couple of different ways. And, and, and at least right now in spring, it sounds like that's something that Dan Lanning sees the ducks as uh, capable of doing. So Keith Brown's definitely the biggest guy that entered the transfer portal for Oregon that we're going to talk about today. So that's why I definitely wanted to, lead the show off with with him and, and kind of what that move means for Oregon. So let's get into our next uh, our next guy here. Trevin Ma'ai is the second duck that entered the transfer portal uh, in the you know past couple of days as the ducks are in spring football. I'll go ahead and read his note just like I did with Brown. Trevin said, quote, thank you, Oregon football, for everything, especially the opportunity to play at this amazing program. I have many cherished memories and relationships in Eugene that I am grateful for. With that being said, I would like to announce that I will be entering the transfer portal with two years of eligibility. It's time for me to find a new home and begin a new chapter. So Trevin Ma'ai, Oregon defensive lineman. Uh, he is he was listed on the 2022 roster at 6'5", 272 pounds. His career stats at Oregon, 32 total tackles, 11 solo, four tackles for loss, two and a half sacks, and one pass defended in 29 games. So he'll have two years of eligibility left, like you said, and we're already seeing some offers coming in for Trevor Mai since uh, entering the portal. You got Hawaii, BYU, Baylor, I think, are some of the other schools that have entered the, the mix for him. And with Trevin Ma'ai, his story at Oregon, you know, he came to Oregon out of uh, national powerhouse Bishop Gorman as a pretty highly touted edge rusher, a uh, really good athlete, um, didn't really see too much time on the, on the field, really, you know, didn't carve out a big role while he was at Oregon. But this is a guy that really changed his body. I want to say he came to Oregon around 220, 230, and, and, you know, he's leaving at around 270. So I think he just kind of struggled to find his role in uh, this Oregon defense, um, which, and I think part of it's telling too, because Oregon's edge rushers, you know, haven't even been that great necessarily, um, you know, the past couple of years, they certainly haven't been up to the standard that they've needed to be. And then more recently here in the spring and, you know, maybe towards the tail end of last season, my got, uh, you know, kicked inside and he got moved to a more of an interior defensive lineman, defensive tackle, if you will. And that's a room that is loaded for Oregon. It was loaded last year. It's loaded this year. And they signed a bunch of guys in that 2023 class, you know, more of those big, big bodies that Oregon hasn't necessarily had a bunch of. And now it looks like they're kind of having them in abundance, so to speak. Um, you know, that being said, I think that there was still some room for him to carve out a role in the two deep or even next year in, in 2024. Uh, but with, with guys like Popo Amavai, Brandon Dorless, Casey Rogers, Taki Taimani, uh, Keon Ware Hudson, all of those guys come back uh, from, from last season and they were all really experienced guys. You know, Popo didn't even play last year because he got banged up and he was a first team all Pac 12 caliber guy. You know, he's probably looking to pick up right where he left off. So that, that's a really crowded room. 
I think, you know, fortunately for Oregon in this situation, you know, no slight to, to Trevin, but this, this isn't that impactful of a move, at least in my opinion, it isn't because he wasn't slated to necessarily have that big of a role. And like I mentioned, the defensive line is a spot that Ducks really, really attacked in the uh, off season, um, especially in the 2023 recruiting class from the high school ranks. You got Tavita Pome, he's already on campus in spring ball. Michael Gardner in spring ball out of Arizona. Um, you know, Mateo Uyunglele, he's already on campus. He's another big body in the trenches. And you got Terrence Green out of the state of Texas and Amari Washington also out of the state of Arizona. And then Jordan Birch comes over from South Carolina. So this is a really, really crowded room. And uh, I, I think that this is a move that Oregon's going to be able to navigate pretty easily, you know, compared to a move like a Keith Brown transfer that we just talked about earlier on. Right. So it's just, uh, you know, the reality of uh, college football is, you know, a lot of transfers. I think I saw a graphic from on three that said Oregon is uh, up there with the programs that have the most uh, transfers this off season. I think that, I think that Trevin and and this this batch marked 25 departures for Oregon, and it's just how things go in college football. You know, um, there's a lot of movement. Um, the transfer portal has made it really easy to move. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's easier to find a landing spot ultimately, but it's certainly easier to get out of your situation if it's not something that you find uh, favorable. But I think that Trevin's going to be able to find a role on another team because he's played a lot of college football. He's been around. Um, Oregon for a long time, you know, the college football for a long time. And, and maybe now that he's changed his body so much during his time at Oregon, maybe it'll help him find, um, you know, a, a role, you know, get on the field more quickly at his uh, next school of choice. So definitely wish him the best, but that's a, another move for Oregon in the transfer portal. The next guy we're talking about is Jaleel Tucker, a rising redshirt freshman cornerback out of San Diego, uh, signed with Oregon in the 2022 class with teammate Jaleel Florence. He entered the portal on April 15th saying, quote, I would like to say thank you to the, to the whole Oregon staff and everyone who has helped me this far. I would like to give a special thanks to Coach Meat and Coach Tosh for taking a chance on me and welcoming me into the Duck family. Oregon will always be a place I love for helping me grow as a man on and off the field. With that being said, I will be entering my name into the transfer portal, signed Jaleel Tucker. So this is another move that I think uh, was honestly pretty surprising, um, you know, for Oregon because Jaleel Tucker just got to Oregon and he, he really didn't play too much as a true freshman. Uh, I think part of that might have been because his body wasn't physically ready, listed on the roster at six foot, 165 pounds, only appeared in one game. Utilized a red shirt, played seven snaps, and recorded one tackle against Eastern Washington. And um, I don't know. It's I think just you know some some differences that you can maybe cite between him and Julio Florence. Julio Florence got to Oregon early to to go through spring ball last year, and and uh, Julio Tucker chose to uh, you know spend the rest of his uh, he wanted to finish out his high school track career. And there, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You know, high, high school only comes around once, and and track is is a, a big part of his life. So he wanted to, to finish that out, but Dan Laney hasn't shied away from talking about the value of being an early enrollee saying it almost even feels like a, an extra redshirt year for those guys that are able to enroll early. And maybe because Florence got to Oregon earlier was definitely more physically developed and ready uh, for the college game and went through spring ball that probably helped him grasp the playbook and adjust to the speed of the college game faster. You know, he wasn't a, a starter, last year, but he was kind of a regular in that cornerback uh, rotation for Oregon. So it's it's a surprise to see him leave after just one year. But um, I think that an interesting question to be to bring to the table here is what does this move say about Oregon's 2023 cornerback class? You know, was it a, was it maybe, you know, this is all hypothetical, right? I don't have any intel on this. I'm not reporting this. I'm just trying to, you know, add to the conversation. What does this move say about the corners that Oregon signed in 2023? Maybe it's a move where it's like, you know, you see these guys come to Oregon to play cornerback and, and maybe Oregon feels better about, about those guys in that room. You know, maybe those guys are going to be you know, relatively early contributors. You know, you'll remember that this is Oregon's first full cycle 
with Dan Lanning at the helm, right? You know, he got thrown into the fire in 2022. He was trying to piece together that class. Uh, Jaleel Florence is one of the guys he was able to get back into the fold. I, I don't think that Jaleel Tucker ever wavered in his commitment, which is which is definitely uh, respectable. But Oregon signed a lot of corners in 2023 is what I'm saying. Um, you know, maybe the headliner of the bunch uh, is, is Dalen Austin or, or Roderick Pleasant, two All-American cornerbacks. Um, Kyrie Jackson comes over from Alabama, so he's an experienced guy that they're going to hope can, can play right away. And you also have Cole Martin, who's already on campus and enrolled. And you also have Solomon Davis, who's already on campus and enrolled, um, going through going through spring ball. So you have all of those guys um, at, at cornerback that are coming in to, to you know compete in that room. And and I think that this staff is probably confident that it, at least two of those guys are, are going to be playing, um, you know, a decent amount of football for for this team. Because the cornerback room loses Christian Gonzalez from last year. You know, you bring in Kyrie Jackson to hopefully get some of that experience. And hopefully he's a plug-and-play guy for Oregon. I think that's the ideal scenario for them. But then you also have Triquez Bridges uh, in that Oregon cornerback room. And it sounds like he's splitting time between corner and safety again uh, in spring, which I think is is pretty eye-catching. Um, because I feel like for him, if he wants to – you know, really take the next step in his game. It seems like it makes more sense for him to focus on on just one position, so he can be a difference maker at that spot. But that's not the approach that that Oregon's taking, at least not right now. Um, and maybe he's working at corner a little bit more because um, because Jamal Hill comes down at, uh, out of the secondary. To, to play some linebackers. So they want to have, maybe that's why he's working at safety, excuse me, um, just to give themselves a little bit more options and, and flexibility there. And then the Ducks also signed Colin Gill out of uh, Washington, D.C. So there's just so many bodies of that position. Maybe it was just a crowded room and, um, you know, the, the path to playing time was, was pretty difficult there. Um, so I think that that's a room that has a lot of, a lot of space to grow, a lot of potential, but they need to do it really quickly because, you know, the season's coming uh, before you know it. And um, Oregon got shredded through the air last year. And part of that, you know, admittedly, part of that was because of the lack of a pass rush. You can't put all of that on the corners or all of that on the secondary. You know, those two, those two aspects, those two elements of the defense have to work in tandem for you to get an effective group at the end of the day. And then there's also Taishim Johnson, the old Miss transfer. You know, he's came to Ole Miss came to Oregon rather from Ole Miss as a safety, but, you know, Hampton and, and uh, Lane have, have talked about just how versatile that guy is. He's playing all over the secondary. He can play pretty much every position, you know, safety, nickel, corner, uh, whatever it is you need him at. So maybe we see him playing some corner as well. And, and, and that could have possibly contributed to this move for, for Jaleel Tucker as well. Um, so, I think that's a bit of a shocker because it was just one year, but that's just the reality of, of where the game's at. You know, you see a lot of guys just, you know, go to school for one year. We saw it with AM, that 2022 class got eviscerated um, by the transfer portal. A couple more notes. Uh, you know, I meant to say this with Keith Brown's transfer, but I think that with Keith Brown entering the portal, Oregon now only has eight of its original 23 2021 signees so eight out of 23 guys in that class are still at Oregon so that just shows you how much movement there's been how much roster churn there's been um you know since that 2021 class got to Oregon so that was kind of notable I thought that was pretty pretty surprising um and then the other you know note that I wanted to talk about on the topic of the transfer portal is Oregon's tight end depth Oregon's tight end depth is is still uh, a major concern here in spring football, you know, maybe that concern level rose a little bit with Terrence Ferguson getting dinged up and Dan Lanning announcing that he's going to be held out for the remainder of spring, leaving Oregon with just two scholarship tight ends and Patrick Herbert and Kenyon Sadiq, um, who's on campus and going through spring practice. So, you know, both Lanning and, and Maringer, you know, were, were pretty, pretty uh, transparent about, you know, the tight end being a spot that they want to address and uh, look for some added depth there. But Lane also mentioned that there's a couple of guys that have some experience playing tight end that that could help them kind of uh, bridge the gap on the depth chart at tight end the remainder of spring. 
uh, noting Mateo Uyunglele as one of them who has a history playing the position. You know, I, I saw Mateo play tight end this past year covering, you know, high school ball out here in the L.A. area for St. John Bosco. He came up with some huge catches. I want to say it was a pair of touchdowns or at least one touchdown against um, modern day in that southern sectional. So that was really big. He's super athletic. Um, I, I think, you know, you don't want to be in the position where you have to be asking him to play tight end because you want him to develop as an edge rusher, but he's an option for Oregon is what we're saying. And it's what Dan Lanning said. And then you have Josh Connerly Jr. Who of course caught a touchdown against Colorado on his birthday, lined up in that 14 J formation, even though he was primarily playing tackle uh, for Oregon last year. And then Jake Shipley is another guy who, who Lanning listed as a, you know, someone to keep an eye on that could help them out. Uh, at the tight end spot, you know, at least through the spring. I don't think that this was a long-term solution because, like I said, the Ducks are obviously going to want to get Terrence Ferguson back, their leading tight end, um, and then add some guys from the portal. And one name that they actually uh, kind of have keyed in on lately uh, with an offer out of the transfer portal is uh, North Texas transfer Varkies Varkies Gums. Uh, This is a guy who logged 458 yards and five touchdowns uh, last year. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's a guy that the Ducks are going after listed on the 2022 roster at, uh, North Texas at six foot three, 230 pounds, redshirt freshman out of Houston, Texas. Um, so he's in the portal and, and he's already become a pretty coveted guy, uh, with, with offers from Utah and some other schools that come to mind. So, um, the portal is going to be interesting to watch, you know, not only with the departures, but it looks like the Ducks aren't done adding as well. Uh, and the tight end is absolutely a priority, right? Especially with your number one tight end banged up. It's not a position that you want to be in. And then even before that, we already knew that the tight end depth wasn't that great for Oregon um, in terms of proven production and returners after losing Maliki Matavau and Cam McCormick. You know, those departures are becoming, uh, you know, they're feeling them a lot more right now in Eugene. So we'll have to keep an eye on the tight end room and, and what developments come from the portal as the Ducks look to add another tight end. That's going to do it on this episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. Appreciate you guys taking some time out of your day to talk some duck football with me. Make sure to lock in with me on all social media platforms, Twitter and Instagram. I am at mtorissports, and then I'm at Oregon Football Max Torres on YouTube. Reminder to like, comment, and subscribe, and share the Ducks Dish Podcast with your friends, with your family, and with other Duck fans. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast.